Hi everyone, welcome back to Information Economics. Today we want to start a new topic, which is the signaling theory. Okay, so I will use one week to introduce the basic ideas. So in this video, I will give you the introduction, and in the next video, we will talk about the main mathematical tool we need for a, a signaling game, which is Bayesian updating. And for the last two videos, I will talk about one specific example about how to model um, a signaling game and how to get the result. Okay, so there are different kinds of principal agent problems, and one of them is a screening problem. Okay, the other is that is more hazard problem. <coughs> In both two cases, the principal is of some informational disadvantage because the agent has some private information. For the screening problem, the agent has hidden information. For the moral hazard problem, the agent has hidden actions. Okay, These are the two types of problems we have studied. Starting from now, we will study another kind of problem. In the signaling problem, it is the principal that have private information. Okay, so the principal is going to know something that the agent does not know. So, <coughs> in the following uh, weeks, when we talk about signaling games, the principal knows some private information, but the agent does not. Okay, the agent does not have a private information. We're going to see. What's going to happen when we have this kind of informational structure? Altogether, screening and signaling are both code adverse selection problems. Okay, so in the future, when someone talks to you about adverse selection, don't forget to first uh, make sure that it is the principal or the agent that has private information. Okay, so. <coughs> Let's talk about the origin of signaling. Professor Akhlov from UC Berkeley, he once studied the market of used cars. Okay, used cars. For used cars, we know it's typically the case that the owner, the seller of a used car, knows the quality of that car. And those potential buyers or consumers do not. Okay, you see a po you see a used car posted on a website or somewhere. You see those basic attributes, but you don't really know how the previous owner treat treat the car and how that car is maintained. So the quality is a hidden inf a piece of hidden information, which can be observed only by the principal. Okay, in this case, the principal is the seller because the principal is going to offer a price for that particular used car. So the issue here is that, first, buyers do not want to buy lemons. Lemons is a word that is proposed by Akhlov to mention those cars that are actually bad. Okay, There are some cars, some used cars, they look good, but actually they are just bad cars. As a buyer, I don't want to buy those lemons, okay? Or in Chinese, it's just a delay. So, buyers will only be willing to pay a price for a used car that is around average, okay? If I pay a high price for a used car, and that used car turns out to be a lemon, I will feel I get some loss, okay? The only way that I can um, avoid that kind of loss is to pay a fewer amount of money. So my price will be only be um, appropriate or be fair for a, a run average used car. Okay? So that means if I am an owner and I have a bad used car, I can be happy because I can sell my car at a higher price, higher than the car that is deserved. But if I am having a good car, then selling that car to the used car market is going to hurt myself. So that means if I am a bad car, bad car owner, 
I will sell my car. If I am a good car owner, my car is not going to go to the used car market. So days after days, we will only see bad cars on the market. And then the expected quality and the average quality will both become lower and lower. <coughs> so that means information asymmetry, again, will introduce inefficiency. In this case, on the market, there will only be bad cars. And that's why people get hurt. Okay, Buyers buy only bad cars. Owners who have good cars cannot get money. So that's inefficient. In a screening game, we know that information asymmetry protects the agent but hurts the principal. In signaling game, in some sense we can say the problem is even worse because information asymmetry is going to hurt both the buyer and the seller. Okay? And eventually, how may we solve this problem? Well, thanks to information technology, thanks to internet, thanks to all kinds of problems uh, studied in this framework. We now have a lot of platforms that suggest reasonable prices for used cars. We now have those are car workshop that can be used to investigate those used cars. Okay, that helps um, buyers to reveal the hidden quality of used cars, and that's going to help eliminate or at least alleviate information asymmetry to enhance efficiency. Another example studied by Professor Spence is about the market of labors. When a labor or when a college graduate uh, who just graduated from college, <coughs> when he must go to the job market to find a job, as a potential, uh, sorry, as an as a agent, as a person, as a graduate, he knows her ability or productivity, but the company or the potential employee uh, employers do not. Okay. So that means the quality is the worker's hidden information. And in that case, it's just like employers are buying employees. Employees are used cars. Okay? So firms will only be willing to pay for around average workers. So even if you are very strong, if the company cannot see it, you will only get average paid. So low productivity workers are happy, high productivity workers are sad, and eventually high productivity workers will leave the market, or for example go abroad, and then the wages in this market will keep decreasing and decreasing, and eventually no one is happy, because um, firms, for example firms, they will only get low productivity workers. And eventually, that's information asymmetry <coughs> causing uh, inefficiency. So, what should we do? Uh, in this case, it's kind of hard for a way to uh, for us to have an uh, online platform so that we can enter some attributes to get a suggested wage. Now, that may be too hard. So, Professor Spence. He argued that this is why people get high education, uh, I mean higher education, okay, or study in good schools. So we know uh, it's somehow it's not very costly for a high productivity person to get a higher degree. In some sense, it's easier, okay. Suppose they are all graduate students, uh, sorry, undergraduate students. Then for those guys who can do a better job in uh, learning or in studying, they will try to get a higher degree so that they can um, somehow distinguish or differentiate themselves with other guys. Okay? However, for low, pro pro low productivity workers, it's more costly for them to do that. So by getting a higher degree, for example a master degree, or by entering a better school, high productivity people may differentiate themselves. In that case, getting a higher degree is going to send a signal to those companies that I am a good student. 
and I can be a good worker. Okay, and through a rigorous analysis, this particular motivation or this particular way to send signal can really happen and be effective, even if education itself is not enhancing productivity at all. Okay, so typically we think going to a good university is to make ourselves、uh, better or be more. A more able to do the job, okay. But、uh, in this argument, schools does not need to be a place that can train students. Schools only need to provide some kind of certificates to students that can really get a degree from them. Okay, the only reason that I I I should say um. Even if schools cannot provide better training, as long as it can provide the signaling effect, students will still be willing to attend good schools. Students will be still be willing to get higher degrees. Okay, so all is because of information asymmetry. It's not because of ability training at all. Okay, so. Based on that two previous example, now we get a very basic idea about signaling. Signaling, the the action of signaling is for the principal to send a message to the agent to signal the hidden information. I know something that you don't know, and I hope you can know it. Then I should try to do something to to convince you that I. Uh, that information is something that you care about, okay? And that sending a signal really requires an action. For example, getting a degree, okay? For signaling to be effective, there is one basic principle that need to happen: is that different types of principles they must take different actions, okay? So, for example,、um, high productivity workers and low productivity workers, they must do something different. Otherwise, the agent has no way to differentiate the principles. Okay, so it must be somewhat too costly for one of the types to take that certain action. Okay, we will see examples. So, some other examples are here. Uh, suppose I am a manufacturer. I may want to offer a warranty policy to signal my product reliability, right? If I am producing reliable product, then my warranty policy will not be very expensive to myself. But if my product, if my competitor's product is bad, he, it will be too costly for him to offer a warranty. So in that case, it's possible that in equilibrium, only good company offers warranty, and then consumers can tell the probability、uh, can tell the reliability based on having a warranty or not.、And、that's one example. A firm may choose a high price to signal the product quality. <coughs> oh, that's another possibility. Or I may offer a full refund policy if. You come to my restaurant and feel the restaurant, the food is not satisfying you. Okay, these are all some examples in business that、uh, companies can use to signal their product quality. Of course, you may also think,、um, let's say, for example, for warranty, it is also possible that those bad companies pretend to be good companies by offering a warranty, right? Or bad companies. Still charge high prices. That's obviously possible. So we need to use、uh, models. We need to do analysis to see whether that may happen or under what condition that may happen and the signaling fails. Okay, that's something to do later on. Okay, so how may we model in the analysis a signaling game? We're going to have a principal and an agent. The principal has a hidden type, because the agent cannot observe the type. The agent will have some prior belief on the principal's type. 
A belief is just a probability measurement. I cannot see your type, so with some probability, I think it is low. With some probability, I think it is high. Something like that. And then the principal will choose to do something that is observable to send a signal. The agent, based on that signal, will then forms a posterior belief on that type. By observing that action, my belief may change through Bayesian updating. Okay, and then based on that posterior belief, the agent will respond to the principal. For example, buy it or not buy it, something like that, and then the principal can take the action to alter the agent's belief. Okay, that's the key in the principal agent problem. So, as an example, we mentioned, a firm makes and sells a product to consumers. Reliability is unknown. Consumers may have some prior estimation about the reliability. The firm chooses to offer a warranty or not. Based on that, the consumer updates the belief and finally decides whether to buy it or not buy it. Later, we will first introduce you the idea about Bayesian updating, and then we will use one example to tell you how this particular thing can be modeled, and how we say it is an equilibrium. And for a given game, how to find an equilibrium and some interpretations. Thank you. Okay, now let's talk about Bayesian updating.、Um, basically, if you have taken any kind of statistics or probability course, then you have learned this in the past. But anyway, let me give you a brief、um, review. So the first thing is that we have a so-called law of total probability, as a Property of probability events. So suppose we have several events y1, y2, up to yk. These events are mutually exclusive, and that means if one happen, then the others do not happen, and they are completely exclusive. That means one of them must happen. Okay. So all together, y1, y2, y3, up to yk, they. they They will together form a sample space, a perfect part partition of a sample space. Okay, and then、uh, we say suppose x is another event. X is another event. Then the probability for x to happen is the following. We can count the conditional probability based on each y i. Then x happen. For this probability, we multiply it by the probability for y to happen. <coughs> so that means、uh, first y one happens. When y one happens, what's the probability for x to happen? Plus first y two happen, and then given that y two has happened, what's the probability for x to happen? And so on and so on. Summing up all of them is going to give us the whole picture of X. Okay, just one、um, theorem, you know. Okay, for some unknowns, we have some original estimates. Okay, suppose something may or may not happen, we have a probability measurement on it. That's something called the prior belief. By having a prior belief, we will assign prior probabilities. To all the possible occurrences of that event, for example, before I toss a coin, my belief of getting a head should be one half. Okay, that's my prior belief before I、uh, toss a coin. Suppose my estimation is correct, then if I do an experiment by trying that particular experiment many many times. The relative frequency of that event, of the occurrence of that event, should be close to my prior belief. For example, if I toss a coin for one hundred times, probably I will see forty-eight heads, because forty-eight is close to fifty.、Uh, That counts for one half of the probability. But if during my after the experiment I see sixty heads 
or even 90 heads, then I probably should guess or should conjecture that my prior belief is somewhat wrong. Okay, so that means I may update my belief to a posterior belief. Based on my observations, I should update my prior belief to my posterior belief. Okay, so to give you an example, let's consider prob uh, popularity of a product. Suppose I have a product to sell. We don't know how popular the product is. Let's assume there are two possibilities, either popular or unpopular. Okay, and at the beginning, we are somewhat confident. We believe that the product is popular with probability 70%. Okay, suppose a consumer comes the consumer may choose to buy it or just go away. Our estimation is that, or our understanding of this product is that if the product is popular, then the buying probability should be 60%. If the product is unpopular, the buying probability should be 20%. Okay, now, suppose one guy comes and goes away. How's the pro posterior belief? Okay, we can update our prior belief 70% to something else. The first thing we have is the marginal probability, P and U. We believe that for probability 70%, the product is popular. With probability 30%, the product is unpopular. We also have those conditional probability. If the product is popular, the probability for one guy to buy it is 60%. Okay, that's how we get this 0 0.42. When the product is popular, the probability for one guy to buy it is <coughs> 70, uh, 60%. And then the probability for the product to be popular is 70%. So 70 times 60, we have 42% as the probability that the product is really popular and someone buys it. For this one, it's obviously 0 0.7 times 0 0.4. And for unpopular products, we have the same thing. Uh, note that this number is pretty small, because this is the probability that the product is unpopular, and also the product is sold. Okay, This conditional probability is 0 0.2, and the probability for the product to be unpopular is 0 0.3, so the product is just 0 0.06. If at the beginning we believe the product is unpopular with a high probability, then this number is going to increase, but eventually you can see this will not be too high. Anyway, based on the current setting, we have this table. And then if we sum up across rows, we can get 48% and 52% as the overall probability for one guy to buy it or to go away. Okay, that's the marginal probability for B and G. <coughs> and now, suppose we really see one consumer goes away. What's the posterior belief that the product is unpopular? It's simply the ratio of this one and this one. Okay, twenty-eight percent is the probability that this product is popular, and this product is sold. Fifty-two percent is the probability that this product is uh, uh this product is not sold. Okay, so this is the very uh, basic conditional probability um, formula, right? The probability that the product is not sold as a condition, and then we infer what's the probability for that product to be popular. It depends on these two conditional, uh, these two probabilities, and then due to the calculation, we can get 54%. Okay? So, <coughs> Originally, the belief of popularity is 70%. With probability 70%, we think 
the product is popular. But if the product is really popular, with a high probability it should get sold instead of not sold. Okay? So that's why when we see one consumer evaluating this product but then goes away, we should somewhat update our belief. And in that case, we become less confident. Okay? Less confident. If we try this again, show the product to another consumer and that consumer also goes away, then the updated belief on P would just become 37%. Okay? It will become even lower. Whenever one guy comes in and then goes away, the posterior belief on P will just become lower. Okay? It will always be that case. Uh, if you want to verify this, simply try to set 0 0.52, uh, sorry, 0 0.54 <coughs> as the new posterior, new prior belief and the 0 0.46 uh, as the new prior belief for you and then try this again, you will see 37%. Okay, after five customers go away in a row, the posterior belief will directly go down to 7%. Okay? If our product is really popular, it should not be the case that five consumers go away in a row. That means we now have a very strong belief that the product is really unpopular. Okay, so now we are ready to um, formalize the uh, updating by the so-called Bayes theorem. Uh, suppose we have those events y1 to yk that are mutually exclusive and completely um, exclusive, and x is somewhat another event. Then, in general, given the observation of x, we may update our belief of the probability for yj to occur according to this formula. Um, sign typos here, this should be x, this should be x, and then this should be yj. Okay, so from here to here, this is the usual um, theorem for conditional probability. Okay, oh, conditional probability. And then the probability of x can be expressed by the law of total probability. Okay, that's the denominator. For the numerator, it's just another application of the definition of conditional probability. <coughs> so, this is how we update our belief based on an observation. When we are uh, uh, mapping this general formula to the previous example we gave to you, then y1, y2 are popular or unpopular, and the x, your observation, is going away or buying one product. Okay, that's how this maps to our uh, specific example. In general, in some cases, it is clear how yi's affect x, right? Uh, we sometimes know that uh, whether a product is popular, affects whether the product is sold. So when we are doing updating, we are going in the reverse direction. We use X, we use the observation to update our belief about those um, hidden facts, and that's Bayesian updating. Okay, so this is the formula, you may want to go over it. In the next two videos, we will tell you how may we apply Bayes' theorem and Bayesian updating to study a signaling game? Thank you. Okay, so now let's try to create our first model for signaling. Uh, suppose there is a company making and selling a product. That product has hidden reliability R. R is within 0 and 1 which is the probability for that product to be functional, okay? So if R is high, that means this product is somewhat more reliable. Suppose a consumer buys a product at a price P, uh, price T, then the utility of the consumer uh, somewhat depends on whether the product is good or not. If the product works, 
then the utility will be theta minus t. So theta is the um, base utility that the consumer can enjoy if the product is functional. But if the product is not functional, then the consumer will simply losing some <coughs> lose some money, and the utility will be negative t. The firm may choose to offer a warranty plan, and the warranty plan, uh, to make it simple, let's assume it has no time limit, and whenever the product is broken, the warranty plan is going to require the company to repair the broken product. In that case, the company is going to pay the repairing cost, small k, and the consumer's utility in that case will be become somewhat lower than theta, but still greater than zero. Okay, theta is assumed to be lower than theta because uh, if you need to ship your product back to the company, you at least incur some inconvenience. Okay, we assume the price is fixed, so the con the, the company cannot choose the price, and the the consumer the company can only choose whether to offer a warranty or not. So based on this setting, we now can write down their utility, uh, expected utility. The firm's expected utility, uh, denoted by UF, is the following. T, minus, T is the payment obtained from consumers. And then with probability 1 minus R, this product will be broken. Okay. And then the, cons the company needs to pay small k to fix it. But this will only happen if w is 1. If w is 0, then the company is not responsible for fixing the product. The consumer's utility, expected utility, is somewhat similar. If the product is functional, the consumer enjoys r times theta. If it is not functional, then it's 1 minus r times eta. <coughs> but this will only happen if the company offers warranty. And in any case, the, the consumer needs to pay small t to, to the, the manufacturer. Okay, so now the, the consumer will buy this product if and only if uc is non-negative. And the firm should choose to offer the warranty or not so that the company can maximize its expected utility. Suppose, uh, I mean to make it simple, let's assume there are only two types. So R is either RH or RL. The product may be reliable or unreliable. And uh, these two numbers are again fixed. Suppose we have complete information. Well, that means the company's reliability can be observed by the consumer. Then uh, the, <coughs> the decision will be very simple. Given RL or RH, the firm's expected utility and the consumer's expected utility are somewhat fixed. Okay, Then as a company, I only need to evaluate two options. If I set W to be zero, okay, then this term will go away. In that case, I need to know whether the consumer will buy it or not. If the consumer will still buy it, then of course, I will choose W to be zero. Or, if the consumer does not buy it, I need to evaluate what's going to happen with W equals 1. If when W equals 1, the consumer will buy it, then I need to decide whether this is a positive number. Okay. Basically, I just need to evaluate that two options if the information is complete. But if we have incomplete information, then the decision will become much harder. First, the, the consumer can make decision only based on some estimation about the reliability. Okay, we denote that with this parameter beta. Beta is the consumer's prior belief on that the product is reliable. 
So that's the probability that, uh, sorry, unreliable. That's the prob probability for R to be R L. Okay. Based on that, the expected reliability is going to be R bar, which is beta times R L plus one minus beta times R H. <coughs> In that case, uh, because the customer cannot see the hidden type, the only thing that the consumer can do is to treat the hidden reliability as the expected reliability or if the consumer is somewhat uh, risk neutral. The firm's expected utility, on the other hand, depends on RH or RL directly because the company can observe that hidden type. <coughs> Finally, we now know the consumer's expected utility cannot depend on RH or RL. It will depend only on R bar. Okay? So, as a company, now uh, you may de still decide whether you want to offer a warranty or not. Again, based on whether the consumer is going to accept your product or not. And then we will see that um, if you are unreliable, basically you will feel happy because that hidden type is going to help you. But if you are reliable, you will be sad because the consumers cannot tell that your product is good. And also, the unreliable firm is going to tend to offer no warranty. Okay, tend to offer no warranty. Because for the unreliable firm, this particular thing is higher, is higher than the reliable company. Because if my product is unreliable, RL will be small, and the probability for me to pay that um, maintenance cost will be higher. Okay, so this creates the basis for uh, signaling. As the cost is somewhat high, the company, the unreliable company, will have some incentive not to offer warranty. So, if the cost difference is high enough, then the reliable company may choose to offer warranty to, to, to signal its quality. Okay, let's see how to do this. So, let's work on the following example. Suppose RL is 0 0.2 and RH is 0 0.8. Okay, it's somewhat very extreme, so that we can show you something in this example. With the probability 20%, the product will be functional. With the probability 80%, the product will be functional. Okay, when you have an unreliable or a reliable manufacturer. Theta is 20, eta is 5. <coughs> so if the company fix your product, you still earn a utility 5 instead of 0. The price is 11, and K is 15 as the cost for fixing the product. In that case, we can write down two different payoff matrices when the product is reliable or when the product is unreliable. Okay, and these are just simple numbers that can be calculated based on their expected utility formula. So I'm going to uh, skip it. Okay. Basically, their decisions are the firm offer or not offer warranties, and the consumer buy or not buy the product. <coughs> you may want to verify that these numbers are really correct. Okay, so now we have an issue. The issue is that the consumer does not know which matrix he is facing. Okay, so the reliable firm should try to convince the consumer that it is the first one, the first matrix that he is, to, he is facing. Oh, for example, if the consumer knows that the product is reliable, then in any case, the consumer should buy this product because 6 is greater than 0, 5 is greater than 0. But if the consumer knows that the product is unreliable, then the consumer will simply go away. So if you are 
a reliable firm, you must somehow induce the consumer to believe that it is the first case. So, when we want to uh, express this kind of game, obviously, it's a dynamic game because the manufacturer first offer warranty or not, and then consumers buy it or not, and then we somehow need more notation on our game tree to denote the fact that some information is incomplete. So we will have a graph like this. When something is boxed, that means it's a player. In particular, at the beginning there is a player called Nature. This guy is somewhat a fictitious, uh, fictitious, fictitious player. And this guy makes decision only randomly. With probability one half, the product is reliable. With probability one half, the product is unreliable. Okay, it's the role played by the nature. Once this happens, player F or the firm knows that the product reliability, and then it makes the decision whether WH is one or WH is zero. For the unreliable firm, it decides whether WL is 1 or WL is 0. Afterwards, now it's the term played by the, com the consumer. The consumer will either observe a warranty or observe no warranty. Okay, But the consumer cannot tell whether it is here or here. So that's why there is a dotted line here. When we use a, 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 I mean dashed line, when we use a dashed line to connect a few points on a game tree, that means the player at this moment cannot tell whether he is here or there. Okay, I know I am at the right hand side of this game tree because I did not observe a warranty, but I don't know whether the firm is a reliable firm or an unreliable firm. After all of this, consumers still need to choose whether to buy or not buy, whether to buy or not buy. That's the game we are facing. Okay, now here, one thing to keep in mind is here we have one half, one half, because beta is one half in this particular example. We assume that the consumer, if no information, will assume that the product will be one half probability <coughs> as a reliable. Okay, so before we solve it, we need to tell you what's the concept of equilibrium in this case. In general, equilibrium means no player has an incentive to deviate, right? But because here we have um, private information, so we need a more careful definition of an equilibrium in this kind of signaling game. Uh, there is a technical term for this kind of uh, incomplete information game. The equilibrium is called perfect Bayesian Nash equilibrium or perfect, ba uh, perfect Bayesian equilibrium. But anyway, let's just call it equilibrium. We know there are two firms. The f I mean, there are two players, a company and a consumer. But according to the nature's selection, the firm will either be reliable or unreliable. So it seems to us that there are two companies. One is reliable, one, one is unreliable, and one of them will participate in this game. So we may say that there are two firms. Each company's decision variable is WH or WL, depending on whether it is a RH firm or RL firm. W will be either 0 or 1. The consumer strategy will be A1 and A0. The consumer needs to decide when he observes a warranty, okay, whether he will buy it or not buy it. That's A1. The consumer also needs to decide if I observe A0, do I buy it or not buy it? That's A0. Okay. So these are the firm's and consumer's strategy. <coughs> also, these two sets or these three sets of strategies must be connected with Bayesian updating. 
or with their posterior beliefs. We're going to assume that P and Q are the posterior belief upon observing a warranty or observing no warranty. So that's the conditional probability when we see W is one, and then we believe that the product is reliable. Okay, that's P. So this is exactly what you may where you may apply the Bayesian updating. We will observe something, and then <coughs> we use that observation to infer the hidden type. That's somewhere we will use、uh, posterior belief, and then an equilibrium will be a strategy belief profile like this. Okay, so in the past, an equilibrium is just a strategy profile, but now it must contain、uh, again strategies, but now also beliefs. An equilibrium is such a profile so that no company wants to deviate based on the consumer's posterior belief and decisions. The consumer also has no incentive to deviate based on his posterior belief and in the company's decision. And finally, the beliefs must satisfy the Bayesian updating rule according to the company's action. Okay, so we will need to specify all of this and make all of them consistent with each other. And once that happens, it is a equilibrium. For a signaling game like this, it will be extremely hard to search for all the equilibrium in once. <coughs> Instead, it will be easier to check whether a given profile is one equilibrium. So the general strategy we will apply is the following: we will start from the firm's action. And try to enumerate all possible actions, and then for each action, we decide whether it is possible to be a part of an equilibrium. So we will first ask: Is it possible that the reliable firm offers a warranty, but the unreliable firm offers no warranty? Okay, that's the case one zero. In that case, we we set up. All the possible a one, a two, a one, a zero, p and q, to see whether it is possible for all of them to be consistent with each other, and then we try all other possibilities. In that case, we can find all the pure strategy equilibrium. In this course, we will not have time to talk about、uh, mixed strategy equilibrium for a signaling game, but I think、uh, understanding pure strategy will be good enough. Okay, so in the next video, we will complete this example to find all the equilibria. Thank you. Okay, so the first case that we want to study is one zero. That means the reliable firm offering a warranty and the unreliable firm offering no warranty. And、um, in this case, basically, we may、um, help ourselves. Um, by highlighting some lines here and here,、uh, this tells us that、uh, we are assuming that the reliable firm is going to offer a warranty, <coughs> and the unreliable firm offers no warranty. Suppose this is the case, then as a consumer, if you observe a warranty, you know that the product is reliable. Okay, so that's why your P is going to be one. You know that the product is reliable. Or if you are observing no warranty, you know the product is unreliable. So your Q would be zero. Okay, P and Q are the conditional probability for reliability for reliable company. <coughs> so P will be one. And the Q will be zero. And then, is that if you are a consumer, in this case, what will you do? Okay, 
So I know p is 1, and I know 1 minus p is 0. In this case, if I am considering buy, buying the product, then for buying the product, my expected utility will be 8 times 1 plus 0, uh, sorry, plus negative 1 times 0. I'm going to buy this product. Okay, I'm going to buy this product. This is of course because if I do not buy it, I simply get nothing. As an unreliable <coughs> case, I will think, okay, this probability is 1, this probability is 0. If I choose buy it, my utility will be negative 7. So in this case, I will not buy it. Okay. So for the consumer, <coughs> its strategy will be, if I observe uh, a warranty, I will buy it. If I do not observe a warranty, I will not buy it. <coughs> so that's, uh, after all these three steps, this is a strategy belief profile. And now we will need to go back to the firm's uh, perspective to see whether there is any firm that would be willing to deviate. <coughs> if you are reliable and you choose not to offer a warranty, in this case, because the consumer's strategy is that once he do not observe a warranty, he will not buy it. So in that case, you were expected utility will become zero okay will become zero compared to eight you will not have an incentive to deviate for <coughs> for the unreliable friend it's basically the same thing if I if my product is unreliable but I offer a warranty consumer sees a warranty consumer will choose to buy it in that case, my utility is negative 1, compared to my utility uh, 0. In the other case, I have no incentive to buy it. So in this case, no firm wants to deviate, and this is an uh, equilibrium. Okay, so now it's the other case. Is it possible that the reliable firm choose to offer no warranty, and the unreliable firm choose to offer a warranty? That's the case, 0, 1. In this case, again, as a consumer, I can tell that uh, the consumer, the, the, the company will be <coughs> either reliable or unreliable in this case. So I can update my belief because the two, consumer, the two companies are making different decisions. And now, as a consumer, I can decide whether I want to buy it or not. In this particular case, if I observe a warranty, I know the product is bad, and my utility <coughs> of buying the product will be negative 3. Okay, will be negative 3. Compared to that, 0 is better. So, I will choose not to buy it. If I am here, and I observe a warranty, I have no warranty, I know it is a high quality product, so I will choose to buy it, because 5 is greater than 0. Okay, so that will be the, <coughs> the consumer's strategy. If there is a warranty, do not buy it. If there is a warranty, if there is no warranty, buy it. Now, is there any company who will be willing to deviate? Uh, yes. Consider the unreliable company. This company knows that in equilibrium, it is going to earn zero dollars. Okay? But if he deviates to offer a warrant, to not offering a warranty, then because consumer will buy it, the unreliable firm will become making $11 as the profit. And in that case, 
the unreliable firm will deviate to offer no warranty. That means it is impossible for this outcome to be stable. That means this is not an equilibrium. It's impossible that these two firms making this strategy simultaneously because the unreliable company will be willing to deviate. Okay, so in the previous two cases, the two companies are making different decisions. So in equilibrium, the consumer can tell who is who based on the observed signal. But it's also possible that these two companies make the same decision. For example, it's possible that both of them choose to offer a warranty. If this is the case, now let's do Bayesian updating. Because as a consumer, you know both companies are offering a warranty. So when you observe a warranty, you have no signal. Okay? So that's why your P is still one half. On the other hand, if you <coughs> uh, if you observe no warranty, then again in this case you have no signal. Okay, you have no signal. But here there is a technical issue that we do not say that Q is one half. Instead, we say Q can be any number, because when you observe no signal. Okay, when you observe no signal, that somehow actually does not happen in this case because we assume that both companies will choose to offer a warranty. So if that's the case, in fact, it's impossible for you to observe no signal, I mean no warranty. So when we assume that the consumer observes a warranty, the consumer has nothing, has no way to do an updating and then the posterior belief can be anything okay because this is something that cannot really happen okay so uh, mathematically of course we can show it but anyway that's the intuition behind that so in general q may be anything okay so p is one half q may be anything now the consumer's decision should be the following uh, if I observe a signal, I have no information, and then P is one half. Based on the fact that P is one half, one minus P will also be one half. And if I buy it six, negative three, the average is one point five, which is larger than zero. So as a consumer. In this case, I should buy it. Okay, I should buy it. On the other hand, as a consumer, I also need to set up my strategy when there is no warranty. Okay, so the consumer need to set up the warranty and uh, the, the decision. Suppose <coughs> the consumer is here. Okay, as we mentioned, the belief can be anything believe can be anything and now it's of course possible for the consumer to make either decision the consumer may choose to buy it or not buy it for example if the belief if the consumer randomly believe that Q is 1 the consumer should buy it if the consumer randomly believe that Q is 0 then the consumer should not buy it okay there is a <coughs> There are some probabilities that the consumer should buy it, some probabilities that the consumer should not, because the consumer really have no information in this case. Okay, so the consumer may choose to buy it or not buy it. But the interesting thing we know is that if the consumer choose to buy it when there is no warranty, okay, then in that case, no company is going to offer a warranty. Or I am saying that if consumer choose to set A0 to B, then both, com both companies will think, if I choose not to offer a warranty, the consumer will still buy it. Then I don't need to pay for the warranty cost, right? Then either company is going to earn $11, which is larger than its previous payoff. 
So it's impossible for A0 equals B as part of the equilibrium in this case. So we would say that, okay, it must be N in this case. However, even if A0 is N, the unreliable company will still deviate to offer no warranty. Think about this. Suppose the consumer decides not to buy it in this case. Then as a company, suppose I choose not to offer a warranty. My result <coughs> will be zero dollar. Okay, that will be my profit. And in the previous case, I was losing one money, one dollar of money because the consumer will buy the product anyway. So that means I have no incentive to pretend that I am reliable by offering a warranty because that's going to hurt myself. It would be better not to do the business with the consumer. So in that case, I would simply choose no warranty. <coughs> okay? So basically that means one one cannot be part of an equilibrium. That's not going to be a stable outcome. Finally, there's a possibility that no company offers a warranty. So that's zero zero. <coughs> okay, zero zero. In this case, we can update Q to be one half. Okay, just as the posterior belief uh, prior belief. But P can be anything. Okay. And now we can say that <coughs> after the updating, P can be anything, but Q will still be one half. As a consumer, now I may decide whether to buy it or not buy it. If I observe no warranty, then I will think the probability is one half, probability is one half. So in this case, I average 5 and a negative 7 is negative 1. I shouldn't buy it. So that's part N in this case. If the consumer observes a warranty, then the consumer may decide to buy it or not buy it. <coughs> in this case, it really depends on how, pos uh, how optimistic the consumer is on the product reliability. If the consumer thinks that it's greater than one half, okay, if the posterior is set to be greater than one third, one third, sorry, then the consumer should choose to buy it. Because with one third, six times one, one third plus two thirds times negative three is going to be zero. So if the probability, if P is set to be greater than one third, you should buy it. <coughs> or, if you set the posterior to be below one-third, you should not buy it. Okay? So there are two possibilities. Either buy it or not buy it. Not buy it if P is less than one-third. And buy it if P is greater than one third. Okay, now we need to decide whether each of them is possible. <coughs> for the former, well, for the former, which means buy it. In this case, if you are a reliable firm, you will deviate to offer a warranty. Because if you offer a warranty and the consumer buys it, you get eight. Previously, you simply get nothing. Okay, so that means this guy is not an equilibrium. But if consumer choose not to buy it in this case, okay, if the consumer choose not to buy it anyway, then of course no company has an incentive to deviate. So it's still possible for this to happen. Consumers choose to not buy it anyway, and no firm offering a warranty. Okay, so now it's time to summarize everything we have. We have just discussed the two possible or potential pooling equilibrium and two possible separating equilibria. What's the definition here? 
in a pooling equilibrium, all the principles, all types of the principles, take the same action. In a separating equilibrium, different types will take different actions. So you know, one zero and zero one. These are equ uh, separating equilibrium. I mean, candidates of separating equilibrium. On the other hand, for pooling equilibrium, that means one one and zero zero. Companies are making the same decision. If we have more than two types, then it's possible to have a semi-separating equilibrium. In that case, some companies are making the same decision, but not all the companies making the same decision. Okay. In this particular example, we found two equilibria, or more precisely, two sets of equilibria. There is one separating equilibrium. The the good company offers no offers or warranty. The bad company company offers no warranty, and the consumers buy the product when there is a warranty, and do not buy the product when there is no warranty. And also, the posterior beliefs can be correctly set. On the other hand, there is also a pooling equilibrium. Both companies choose to offer no warranty. And no consumer buys the product, and then we have a set of po possible posti <coughs> posterior belief that is consistent with the player's decision. Okay, so what does that mean? Under the separating equilibrium, one guy offers a warranty, the other guy offers no warranty. And based on that signal, the consumer can really see the can really tell the hidden reliability. That means the reliable firm is successful in signaling her reliability. And in this case, the system is somewhat efficient. It's somewhat efficient. The 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 company offers a warranty, and the <coughs> the firm. And the consumer can see it. Okay, it's not really efficient as efficient as the complete information case, but it's more efficient than the no signaling case. Okay, and of course, this may be true because the unreliable firm find it too costly to pretend to be having a high reliability because that cost is really too high. So that's why, in this case, uh, the, the 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 unreliable firm will not deviate to offer a warranty. Unfortunately, it's still possible to have this pooling equilibrium, in which no trade is established at all. Okay, so we can see that in this uh, signaling game, due to information asymmetry. It's still possible that no trade can be accomplished, and it's in past. It's still possible that no one can really buy the product. So obviously, this is very inefficient, and everybody are unhappy about that. <coughs> so you probably want to ask. Then, what's our con conclusion? In such a game, there is no specific conclusion or. Predictions we may make, according uh, based on their decisions. Okay, we cannot predict exactly what's going to happen because both are possible. Okay, both are possible, but at least we can say that it's possible for us to have a satisfactory outcome, which is the separating equilibrium. Under this separating equilibrium, we get a satisfactory outcome that. The one cons one company can successfully signal the signal. Okay, there are other situations that you really have no separating equilibrium, and all the equilibrium are pooling, and you may expect a very inefficient outcome in that case. Okay, so, uh, in general, for all kinds of signaling game, we may have multiple equilibria, and at least we hope that. We may have at least one separating equilibrium. That means 
it's somewhat possible for the firm, for one of the firms or one of the principles to differentiate itself from other inefficient type of principles. Whew. So in the lecture, I will give you some more examples to help you understand this stuff. That's the end of today's lecture. Thank you.